Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Unfortunately, I have to follow up with great leaders in our class who gave great senior lectures. Um, again, I'm Chris Anderson, one of the fourth years. Uh, and I'll be giving my senior lecture today. Um, so usually with these senior lectures, what, what I've seen in the past years is people will, will end their lecture saying great things about their class. Um, I want to do it a little bit different. I want to start by actually talking about saying great things about our class and, and also end uh, by saying great things about our class. Um, but I'm sure you guys know I'm going to praise our class. So um, I just want to, uh, th these next few slides will just be um, actually comments on others who, who've said great things about our class. Uh, I talked to other people and asked what, what's the best things um, that you liked about the fourth years graduating. Um, and here are some of the feedback that I've gotten. So um, that didn't work, so let's try this. So I've been told that we are some of the hardest working residents in, in prior years, um, that we're <laughs> early to work, uh, hard work, uh, great work ethic. Um, we're always on time to sim and procedure labs and we're, we're always engaged when we're at these labs, um, always paying attention. Um, I've heard that we've picked some of the best chiefs throughout the past years. <laughs> Um, uh, and that, that, that we, that our chiefs um, make amazing schedules and, and put them out on time, um, that we're, we're always attentive uh, during, during shift, during, during conference, uh, that we're some of the top educators um, to our juniors, to our attendings, um, that we always make conference our top priority, um, <laughs> and that we have the best education chief. Um, but, uh, I, I look up to my class and I, I want to be, be like them. So I, I too try to fit in and become a, a clinical monster. <laughs> so now that everyone's awake because you don't want to end up on your classmates uh, senior lecture, I'm going to get into my topic. Uh, I chose to do event medicine for my topic because uh, it's something that we don't get a lot of experience in. Uh, that we don't get to learn about, uh, learn a lot about during um, our clinical shifts. Um, but there are some opportunities I've thankfully have got to um, do some work with the, with the marathon with Dr. Silverberg, Dr. Jane, um, also with, uh, with event medicine with Dr. Tapshi. Uh, so I just want to share some things about event medicine and hopefully get you interested because um, it's something you can do after residency. I'm hoping also to do some more um, after residency. Uh, so thank you to Dr. Willis, Dr. Tapshi, uh, who does a lot of work that I'll get into, and then Dr. Hassel uh, for help with this presentation. So today we're going to talk about what, what is event medicine? Um, what is our role as, as doctors uh, at these uh, events? Um, uh, what are some common conditions that you're gonna see? And then we'll go into some cases that, are, that you may see in the emergency room, but they're more specific to um, events in general and how we can um, actually treat these people um, starting from, from time zero. Um, so uh, this is directly from the University of Wisconsin page uh, who probably has one of the best definitions of what event medicine actually is. Uh, so broadly defined event medicine is the planning, execution, and post-event review of medical care provided during any mass gathering. Uh, so this ever-growing part of emergency medicine involves working with multidisciplinary disciplinary groups of professionals to predict and coordinate the response to illness and event, uh, and injury for event spectators and participants. So they look at historical patterns of patient presentation, weather predictions, intel from law enforcement and published experience at similar events to coordinate responders and prepare resources. So while it just may appear that we are simply staffing first aid stations and providing on-scene medical care, event medicine experience is much deeper than that. So due to the multiple variables and highly unpredictable nature of mass, mass gatherings, event medicine demands rigorously scripted yet highly flexible plans to manage medical needs for quote unquote routine emergencies while keeping in a watchful eye on mass casualties. Um, so here goes a brief overview of what it takes to actually plan an event and how um, it's set up uh, during the actual event. So it starts with the event coordinators. Um, that's usually your, your big groups like Insomniac um, or New York Roadrunners who are planning um, music festivals or more marathons. Um, and they're, they're always in communication with the local government. So the the mayor and, and local law enforcement are, are giving guidelines on what, what, what can happen, what's going on in your city, what hospitals are full, where, where traffic stops are in case you need to um, transfer people to the hospital. Um, so the government's in contact with those leaders and then they're also in contact with the command center. So every event will have a command center 
Um, it's like a brief, um, a local place where um, top um, leaders from the security division, from the production division, and also uh, a medical leadership will all be in the same tent watching the entire event um, and, and kind of coordinating everything that's going on. Um, and that trickles down to the medical tent. So there's usually one main medical tent, which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, and that's staffed by us um, as the medical director that's staffed by, by nurses, paramedics, but you also have residents out there volunteering, medical students, and then you just have volunteers uh, there to help. Uh, and usually near these medical tents, you have EMS park. It may just be like the four by fours on smaller tents. Um, they're able to transport people to the main tent. Um, or you'll have uh, ambulances ready to transfer people to, to the hospital. Uh, and the command center is always in contact with the, with the hospitals around so they know what's coming, they know which hospitals are full so they don't overwhelm any one hospital. Um, so this is a, an example. Uh, this is a, a map of EDC uh, in Orlando. Um, and I just wanna turn your attention to the mouse over here. Yeah, so the, the um, red plus signs are the medical tents. So there's usually one main medical tent. That's why it's bigger near the main stage. And this is where they're going to get all your critical patients. This is usually where the doctor is going to work. Um, where you get your critical access, your critical patients, you're going to have your, your EMS waiting there to transfer people, but then you're going to have smaller tents all throughout the event. Here goes one here, one here. Um, I think there's one near here, near other stages. Uh, this is for, for a music festival. And these are usually staffed by your, um, by your RNs, your EMTs, uh, they can handle lower acuity issues. And then if they feel like they need um, higher level of care, they'll, they'll um, communicate with the command center who will communicate to the main medical tent and get them transferred over to the main medical tent. So what are different events that we can work at? So we can, uh, for, for events, there's music festivals like EDC, Governor's Ball, Izu, Coachella, um, there's marathons and half marathons. We actually have uh, the Brooklyn half marathon here. And then every year we, uh, in New York, except for last year, we have the New York marathon. Um, there's obstacle races, obstacle course races that you can work at like Spartan race, Tough Mudder, uh, and then all types of sporting events um, from amateur, from Pop Warner to high school to college and professional sports. Um, horse races, you're the, you're the jock duck. Um, and then car races also. Um, so what exactly is our role um, when we're at these events? So as the, as the doctor there, you're in charge of all executive decisions. Um, so you, you choose who needs to be transferred, who needs to just stay and, and sober up. You choose um, uh, who needs higher level of care, who can just get treated and go back to the, go back to the event. Um, you're in charge of all critical care. So any critical patients, you, you are the, the leader, you have to stabilize them um, prior to transfer. Uh, this includes all the procedures. So intubations, lacerations, joint dislocation reduction, splints, that's all, you're in charge of all those. Um, if you have a great team, you can walk um, someone through a laceration or a reduction, uh, they can do it, the EMT can do it, but you have to be there to sign off on the final charts and walk them through it. Um, a lot, at some of the events, especially music festivals, there's always uh, famous people, um, and so if they ever get sick or um, get hurt, that you, you will be the person taking care of them there. Um, also, if there's intoxicated minors less than 18, you, you have to um, be in charge of them to make sure that they're, they cannot leave. They can't go back to the events um, and they can't leave on their own. So you have to call their parent uh, and come, come get them picked up. Um, and then in terms of orders, you, you have to be the one to tell the EMTs uh, and the nurses to, uh, what, what, what dose of sedation you want to give someone, what, what dose of meds you want to give them. Um, so you're probably asking, what, what do you have access to at the, these events? Uh, they actually have a, access to a lot of medications, a lot that we have here in the hospital. So in terms of sedatives, um, you have ketamine, Haldol, Versed, Ativan. Um, if someone goes into cardiac arrest or, or pericode, you have epinephrine, calcium, bicarb, adenosine, atropine. You even have Narcan for overdoses. Um, and then you have uh, miscellaneous pain medications, morphine, Tylenol, ibuprofen, uh, Zofran, you have D50 and glucagon for hypoglycemic patients. Uh, and then if you do need to intubate, there is a laryngoscope. Um, but a lot of times they don't have glide scope just in case you don't have access to power. Um, and then you have your RSI, all your RSI meds, rocuronium sucks, how many propofol. Uh, there are always ice paths. Um, we'll get into why um, there's ice paths. And then you have access to EKGs also. 
you have a question, Dr. Silverberg? Yeah, I think this is all dependent on what group you work for and, and where you are. I know, especially at the marathon, most of the patients, anybody who is even remotely a little sick, just gets put in and taken to hospital. They try not to bring them into the tent, just do stuff with them in the field. This is a better outcome in the hospital. So this is all dependent on who you're working for and where you're working. Yeah, so Dr. Silverberg was just saying this is all dependent on uh, where you're working and who you're working for. A lot of times, like the marathons, which he does, uh, any sick patient will skip the tent and just go straight to the hospital. Um, I've had some experience where they have, uh, at a music festival, where they have just treated people and let them go back to the festival. We'll get into some of those things. Um, but again, any sick people, uh, they will come to stabilize and then transfer. Um, so what are some things that we see at, the, at these events? Um, so we just see a lot of alcohol intoxication. I remember when I worked um, at Governor's Ball, it was a Friday, uh, a lot of teenagers were there and there was a lot of uh, teenage alcohol intoxication. Um, a lot of um, marijuana, um, K2 is, is big here in Brooklyn, you might see that. Um, heroin use, and then we all know that some, sometimes heroin can be mixed with fentanyl. Um, so you, you may see overdoses on that, uh, Special K, ketamine. Um, is, is a highly um, abused drug, uh, GHB even, um, and cocaine. Uh, not pictured here too, which we might see um, meth and PCP. Um, you also might see, uh, we talked about dislocations, uh, shoulder dislocations and different types of fractures. So for the dislocations, um, you, you do have the opportunity of, uh, or you, you probably should reduce it. Um, if you have the, the sedatives and the capabilities to do so. And then, I mean, you, you are gonna encourage the person to go to the hospital and get, get the pre-reduction x-ray and you get checked out. But if they really wanna refuse and get back to the, the, hosp, uh, the, the event, you just now gave them that opportunity to enjoy the event that they paid a lot of money for. It's up to them, but they, they do have that opportunity. Um, and then we're also uh, can repair lacerations um, and get them back out to the events. Uh, so we, we, as the doctors can do, repair these lacerations or walk um, a medical student through it or EMT, uh, or if there's a resident there, they can do it on there. Um, we also see a lot of seizures at, at events. Um, we'll get into some, some causes, but there's uh, drugs can cause uh, these seizures. It could be people with history of epilepsy who forgot to take their medication that morning. They were so excited, or they did take the medication, but their seizure threshold was just um, lowered by the, by, the, by the heat, by drinking, by doing different drugs. Um, and then hypoglycemia uh, can lead to seizures, um, which hypoglycemia you might see a lot at events. Uh, people with uh, pumps, they might malfunction while they're there. Uh, they're drinking while on these pumps. Uh, just people with history of uh, diabetes are on insulin or sulfonylureas, and uh, now they're out in events and, it, and it's crowded and they're, they're in the middle, they're in front of the stage, they don't wanna lose their place. So, they, um, uh, so they, they're not gonna walk all the way to the cafeteria to get food. Um, or at, at um, marathons, they're, they're running and they're, they don't have time to stop and eat. So they might, they might become hypoglycemic. So does anyone know who this is? So I'll tell you his name is, is Corey Stringer. Uh, he unfortunately did pass away. So we're gonna get into some cases uh, that you might see at these events, uh, or events that you're working at. So imagine you're, yourself you're, you're working at a, at a football, you're just there at football practice, actually. They hired a doctor to work at a football practice. Uh, and you have a 27-year-old gentleman. Uh, he's out practicing in the, the middle of the summer. This happened to be in, in 2001. It was 90-degree weather, the heat index of 9,900. Um, they finished practice. He starts vomiting. Um, he's, he's trying to drink water, but then he passes, uh, he passes out and then collapses. Um, so what do you what do you guys think was going on, and what vital sign do you think was most abnormal? Yeah, temperature. So when he got to the hospital, he was 108 degrees. He was unconscious on admission, and actually, unfortunately, went into multi organ failure and passed away the next day. Um, so something that you might see at events is is heat illness. Uh, so heat illness is a spectrum. Um, uh, it goes from uh, as low as just heat cramps, which you see very often in, in athletes where uh, their calves um, or their abdomen will start to cramp. Uh, usually people say, oh, they're low on potassium, give them um, hydration, sometimes they eat a banana in the middle of an event. Um, and then it goes up to heat exhaustion where usually it's just like they're dehydrated, they're, they're vomiting, 
Uh, they're generally weak, but they're still, um, their mental status is still the same. Uh, there, there are two types of heat exhaustion. So there's just water depletion um, where they're just dehydrated. They need water, but then there's also salt depletion where they're, they're losing salts and their insensible losses uh, and they're drinking a lot of water. Um, uh, so they, they just become dehydrated, quote unquote. Um, and then uh, they can, it can develop all the way to heat stroke. So that's defined as a temperature greater than 104 degrees, where now your body cannot regulate and you're gonna um, become hyperthermic. You're gonna have, start having mental status changes. So the most common neuro finding in, in heat illness is ataxia, but it can range every, anywhere from irritability all the way to coma, uh, which Chloe eventually went into. Um, uh, and then, the, uh, so who's at risk? It's, it's elderly people, um, people who are chronically ill, but also they're very young, and then athletes just because they're, they're working out um, in, in hot weather usually. And then some medications can put you at more at risk, like anticholinergics, diuretics, sympathomimetics, uh, it was found out later on that he was on a drug called ephedra, um, which is a, a weight loss drug um, that they think may have contributed to why he um, went into heat stroke. Uh, so how do we treat it? So the goal is to cool. So if someone, if you're, if you're working at this event and they come in altered, you, they feel really hot, you take their temperature, they're greater than 100, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Your goal is to cool them down to less than 102 in like less than 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, so how do you do this? So if you're out, out in an event, you want to remove all their clothing, you want to uh, put ice packs all around them. Hopefully you have a fan uh, to get to, to cool them off. But, all, but a lot of these events that I've seen at both at the marathon and music festivals are just ice baths. So you want to dunk them right away. Um, granted, their their airways intact and you already covered your ABCs. Um, you want to dunk them. Um, antipyretics do not have a role, so they won't work in the, in the situation. Uh, and you may want to use benzos um, for, for agitation, uh, also for shivering. So the more they move, the more their, um, their muscles contract, the more that they're going to generate heat. All right, we're going to go on to another case. So imagine yourself, you're working at the main medical tent at the finish line of the New York Marathon. Uh, EMS calls in a, a 35-year-old female, no past medical history. She just collapsed around mile 23. Uh, she is seizing. You get the call for a seizure. Um, uh, the seizure began before she fell and, and she's still altered towards EMS. Uh, her running partner, uh, does tell you that she seemed to be more tired than usual and had to stop at every, every mile marker to drink water. Uh, he thought she was well hydrated because last night she kept drinking a, a lot of water. Uh, so what do you think is going on and what lab would you want? Sodium. Sodium. Exactly. So this is actually exercise associated hyponatremia. Um, so some risk factors that can make, uh, cause you to have uh, EAH, uh, so overhydration, so fluid intake greater than three liters during the event, um, or uh, people who waterboard, meaning they, get, they become really hydrated the night before, uh, preparing uh, for a long run. Um, people who exercise longer than four hours have a low body weight. Um, female gender is, is more likely to develop EAH. Um, they found in studies that if their post-race weight was greater than their pre-race weight, it's probably because they are retaining a lot of free water, um, puts them more at risk. Uh, extreme temperatures um, can also put you more at risk. Um, NSAIDs may have a role. Um, they think because NSAIDs decrease the GFR, um, that it may impair the urine diluting capacity of the kidney. Although studies have shown that it, it's, it's unclear at this point. Um, uh, some little bit of the pathophysiology behind it, it is a dilutional, um, condition. Uh, usually, uh, athletes and marathoners are, are running, losing a lot of salt and sensible losses, and they're drinking free water. Um, so, so they, they become, uh, hypervolemic, hyponatremic, uh, and it's a spectrum. So they can go all the way, um, they can be asymptomatic, um, just a little tired, but then it can develop to, uh, severe encephalopathy that can develop seizures, respiratory distress, and even death. Uh, so what do you do in this point? Um, so mild asymptomatic hyponatremic um, uh, people with, with EAH, actually the treatment is to fluid restrict them. Uh, you don't want to give them uh, normal saline. You might worsen the, the hyponatremia. You want to fluid restrict them and then monitor uh, for diuresis. Once they start urinating, you'll know they'll start urinating off that. The free water and, um, and their concentration will normalize. Um, but if they develop severe hyponatremia, like sodium less than 120, and they're altered or even seizing, like, like you want to give them 3%, uh, 100 milliliters of 3% over 10 minutes, over 10 minutes, and then transfer for close monitoring. Uh, and because it's an acute issue, it's okay to treat acutely and treat fast. 
Um, there have been no reported cases of, of uh, ODS in treatment of EAH. There's actually a small, I mean, a small case series, only seven marathon runners uh, that ended up develop, developing it. Six of them got treated with hypertonic saline. Um, and uh, one person did not. The one person who did not ended up passing away, actually. And five out of the six that were, were treated with hypertonic saline got MRIs one year after treatment, and they all were, they were all normal. Um, another electrolyte, electrolyte abnormality that may develop uh, with EAH is hypokalemia. Uh, so you can replete that orally if oh, sorry, orally um, if they're if they're able to do so. Um, and with K repletion, you'll you'll uh, actually raise the serum sodium also. All right, so last case. Uh, so you're, now you're working at a music festival, you're working at EZU in the main medical tent. Uh, you get a call from tent one, which is out on another field. Say they're bringing in a 28 year old gentleman uh, for altered mental status and seizure while he was dancing in the crowd during one of the performances. So the bystanders show this video of this guy dancing one hour prior to the, to the seizure. Um, when he arrives to your tent, he, he has another seizure right in front of you. He feels really hot. Um, he's not protecting his airway. so. Uh, you're, while you're intubating and you're proceeding to cool him because you suspect he has, he has heat stroke, um, one of the paramedics pulls out a, a bag of pills from his pocket. Uh, so what do you guys think is going on? This one's a little tough. Yeah, what was the first one you said? Molly, Molly yep. So yeah, so this is MDMA toxicity, um, aka Molly, X, Ecstasy, Skittles, Smarties, Beans, uh, different street names. Um, for it. Uh, so uh, MDMA causes this catecholamine release, uh, ser serotonin release and inhibits serotonin reuptake. Uh, and, and clinically it causes this feeling of euphoria, wakefulness, intimacy, sexual arousal, and disinhib disinhibition, uh, which is what people want at these music festivals, especially the techno music. Um, they, they want the, these kind of side effects. But um, in, in Overdoses are a little bit more than you should be taking. It can cause agitation and tachycardia and hypertension, uh, similar to a sympathomimetic toxicity, serotonin syndrome. Um, you can go even go into multi organ failure. Um, so with overdose with, with Molly or MDMA, uh, you can develop um, a multitude of complications. Um, um, some being hyponatremia, which can lead to seizures. So uh, MDMA increases ADH production. So now your water is going to re be retaining, your body is going to be retaining free water. Um, and then also you're out in an event and if it's hot, they're drinking a lot of water because they're dancing, they're having fun. And so now they're, they're um, having excessive free water intake. Um, it can lead to hyperthermia because uh, they're dancing, they're having fun out this event. It can lead to rhabdo AKIs, which then can lead to cardiac dysrhythmias. Um, because of the hyperthermia, uh, they can become coagulopathic and have intracranial hemorrhage and eventually go into multi-organ failure. Uh, so what do you do at this point if you have this, this patient in front of you? Uh, so again, ABCs, like all our critical care patients, uh, you may have to intubate, uh, you may have to cool, um, benzos for seizures. Um, it's all supportive care. There's no, no reversal for this medication. Uh, you should cool for hyperthermic patients. If you notice uh, they're developing a serotonin-like syndrome, you can give them ciproheptidine, but you may not have it there um, at the event. Um, and then when you check your point of care labs and if they're hyponatremic, you can even give them 3% saline. Uh, GI decontamination um, does not work. It's, it's typically contraindicated just because uh, for Molly, it's usually a small amount uh, that people take to, to overdose. Um, and they're at risk for not protecting their airway. So um, usually you do not want to give any GI decontamination. Uh, so now that I got you interested in, in event medicine and you, you hear about all these cool cases and how you can help, um, there are a multitude of uh, companies that you can volunteer with uh, or even work for. So uh, we have a couple of our attendings, Dr. Ahern, Dr. Salway, Dr. Tapji, who work for Paradox and do event medicine. Uh, there's CrowdRx, which is very similar, uh, and the New York Roadrunners always um, always ask for volunteers every year. I know Dr. Silverberg uh, and Dr. Jane, who, who left, were, were a big component of, of asking for volunteers in that. Uh, so please reach out to Dr. Topchi um, or even Dr. Silverberg if you want to get more involved, and I hope to be doing more of these next year and, and get residents more involved. Uh, so some take-home points. So event medicine is a team approach. Um, uh, you have to have good communication with the local, the local government, the event planners, 
uh, with your team. Um, Heat-related illness is a spectrum, but goal number one in heat stroke is to cool the patient less than 122 degrees as quickly as possible. Uh, EAH is a very common but dangerous condition for marathon runners. Um, and then consider MDMA toxicity for your hyperthermic seizing altered patients at music festivals. Um, so I'm not completely done with my lecture, but this is the end of the educational component. So uh, I'll just stop here and open up for any questions or comments um, now. Dr. Serber? Sure. So uh, I work for in house physicians. That's the group that I work for. Um, it's not quite as glorious as going to all these very huge festivals or anything, like really working sometimes. Um, one of the Pfizer ones I did, because I, I don't know if you realize this, but every state has a law. If you have a gathering of more than X number of people and every state is different, you have to have a physician on site. So one of the ones I did recently was a Pfizer convention, and they were giving out flu shots at the Pfizer convention. And I must have given out like, 400 or 500 flu shots a day for the whole convention. It was brutal, brutal work. So <laughs> that one was actually really big. But a lot of them were fun. I used to be a doctor for the Mets and my good old Mets team. That was a good time too. Uh, but it's, it's a lot of work. You just have to get involved and sort of like, in the beginning, volunteer. So when I go to the sporting event, like the golf open, I'll call them or write to them and volunteer to be a physician or one of the physicians for the event. And that's a good way to get on their radar and start to do stuff. And then usually they'll put you with a company that also does it, or they'll call you back if they have another event that they're doing. This is a good way to get involved by doing involved. Were, <laughs> were you guys able to hear that at home? Yeah, okay. Any other questions or comments before I move on? Yeah, like I said, I hope to also work for Paradox next year and get get us more involved in those events. Just realize there's not many events going on, so it's really yeah. really good. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't yeah. had a call in the October year and a half for any event that just did not. Your time might be up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, okay. So, oh, close the chat. All right, so this is actually the part that I was dreading the most. Um, I'm gonna keep this short and sweet just because I don't want to get emotional. Um, but uh, I just want to say some good things about my class. Um, so it was just three and a half years ago now that we were all bright eyed, uh, happy, eager uh, interns ready to start. And I just have to say that it's, it's really a beauty to see us all progress into to leaders that we are um, and see us all gonna go off and do big things. Um, I just want to thank you for accepting me into your, into your family, uh, introducing me to your moms, your dad, your significant others, brothers, sisters, kids even, um, and pet kids. Um, I'm really going to miss all you guys. Thank you for accepting me, um, Nicole, and my family. Also, um, like I said, I'm going to miss you guys, but I know our chat's never going to go dry. We're always going to be in contact. Um, so just thank you. Um, and thank you to all of our um, program directors, assistant program directors and attendings um, for, for teaching me everything you guys know so far. Uh, I've learned so much from all you guys and I hope to continue um, giving that forward. So just thank you. <laughs>